Thank you for very important and interesting presentation. My name is Irina Gerasimova. I am from Moscow Russian Academy of Sciences. I have two questions to the first presentation. Uh, the uh, first one is about the social and economic factors of vulnerability. Could you say some more about what we mean economic social factors to fall in poverty uh, and uh, to change uh, the, the statement of uh, household? And the second one, if you have the task to estimate the dynamics of vulnerability in the bigger real, uh, such as South Africa or South America and so on. But uh, if each country has own level of poverty, and the bottom um, uh, lines of middle class, how to use your second approach. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, then over there, the gentleman. My name is uh, Niranjan. I work in the UN Regional Commission uh, uh, for Western Asia. Uh, thank you for the excellent presentations, but my question is to Peter. Uh, first of all, uh, the approach of uh, defining vulnerability line and uh, defining the middle class. This is something is of my interest also, which we are doing in the Arab countries. So I liked uh, the approach that you are proposing. But my question is, if you have a lower bound for middle class, which is the vulnerability line, what is the upper bound? Your, your former colleague uh, specified $13 uh, in PPP, but uh, I didn't see that, so what is your uh, response to that? My second question is uh, uh, specific to India. Since uh, in my previous uh, uh, thesis, I was, uh, I mean, in my thesis I was working on the NSS data. You, you proposed this imputation method to calculate another consumption expenditure for the households, but uh, I think some uh, years down the lane, uh, Professor Deaton had suggested if we can use the grouped data, particularly because Indian households have very high fixed effects, which you have highlighted also, because of cultural expenses, because of uh, maybe because of indebtedness, uh, maybe uh, because of seasonal migration. I mean, these are the factors which extremely affect Indian households' consumption data. Now, if you impute, then I, I expect that the error variance may be high. Uh, but did you try with the grouping of households taking into account some common characteristic, characteristics as you identified, and calculating the mean expenditure for, those, for that and creating a panel uh, f f uh, to apply that method. Thank you. Thank you very much. And then we have a gentleman here. University of New South Wales. Um, another question for Peter. Um, as you were introducing your talk, I was thinking that I was expecting what, the, what you would do would be to try to work out the, um, the probability of transition into, prob into poverty for people at the vulnerability line rather than the average for those above or those below it. Um, is there a reason why you didn't follow that strategy? I'm guessing there are practical reasons for implementation why you didn't do that. Thank you very much. And then we have a, a lady there a little bit uh, further. First presenter. Let's mention for the for the Susanas data sources, you you have calculated from ninety seven to ninety five for the poverty. Uh, actually, we have four panel data that from Susenas is 2002, 2004, and then 2005, up to 2007, that the panel data. My question is, uh, can you just define the data sources? Uh, can you put logical comparable among years? That's my question. 
my assumption you use the similar data sources from Susenas. If not, maybe my question will be disregarded. And for the second presenter for Davis, uh, you calculate the log financial asset for per capita regression that stated uh, the percentage of urban, the yeah, variable percentage of urban population, it was really small, uh, 0 0.008. Uh, in, term, in this uh, inequality, this is very, yeah, very small coefficient. Uh, what is actually the purpose of this small coefficient in the analysis of inequality? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Let's stop here now for the time being and let's give our presenters um, a chance to make the first, uh, first questions. Maybe would you, Jim, start and Peter can sort of put his uh, comments together. Jim? Yeah, uh, the idea about uh, the percentage of urban population and the financial assets uh, regression is that um, it's an indicator of... Uh, you know, people, urban population has better access to financial institutions. So you would expect that uh, with a more urbanized population, on average, you know, access to financial institutions is easier and cheaper uh, for that population. Um, and so as an example of uh, variables like that that we uh, tried in these different regressions, uh, it turns out to be a significant variable. So, you know, we, we of course, uh, keep it in the regression. You're right, it's a... It's a pretty small uh, uh, coefficient, um, but uh, you'd have to look into that a little bit further to uh, find out, you know, you know, for example, what does a, uh, quantitatively, uh, how large the impact is. It may be that it's quite small, but it is, is a theoretical reason for it being there, and it's a significant variable, so we keep it. Uh, thank you, Jim, and then uh, Pete. Very cool. Thanks very much for the uh, thanks very much for the for the questions. I, I, I'll try and, 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 and answer. I'll try and uh, I'll try and uh, I'll move over. Thanks very much. I'll try and uh, uh, and respond to at least some of these these questions. Thanks very much. On the first, on maybe taking the last question first. Um, the, the, the validation exercise that we reported on the Indonesian uh, data uh, based on the, 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 the research that we had done in a separate paper was based on the Indonesian Family Life Survey, the IFLS, rather than the Susanas, because we were interested in taking a, a true panel data set and then testing the method against the true panel data set. And in testing the method, what we did is we treated the IFLS as though it was not a panel data set. So we, we, we took the panel subsample, say, from round one, we split that sample into, into two subsamples separately, and then we implement the methodology across the two subsamples in such a way that we could treat them as though they're, as though they're basically not, uh, not panel data at all. We apply the methodology, we reproduce the transition probabilities, and then we check against the true panel transition probabilities that are in the, in the IFLS. So both the, the validation work using for Indonesia as well as the validation work for, for uh, um, Vietnam was based using the actual panel data set but treating them as though they were not panel data, implementing the method as though they're not panel, and then checking against the, the panel dimension of the work. So the Susanas data were not used in this exercise at all. I do have a separate study that's sort of ongoing at the moment with a colleague where we're going to try to implement the methodology using the Susanas data because it would then allow us to do some kind of uh, panel type of analysis on a very much larger sample size in, in, in Indonesia if we could use the Susanas data for this purpose. But we want to uh, probe and, and test that and validate that as well as we can before we do that in a, in a large scale. And that's, that's kind of still ongoing at the moment. Um, this, the question about um, the calculating the probability at the vulnerability line, I, I think that's an interesting uh, point. I, I can't say off the top of my head that we thought a whole lot about that. My quick reaction, I think, is that it will have posed some computational challenges, particularly you know, sufficient sample sizes and so on at a particular point. It's going to be much more difficult to do. But I, I, yeah, we could, yeah, it would be like an additional level of, 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 of fitting that would be going on. But it's something that's worth thinking about. And uh, uh, so I, I'm grateful for the, for the comment. Um, 
the question of the upper bound of the, on the vulnerability line, we, we sort of defined the middle class, but we, didn't, we sort of let the middle classes range all the way up to the, to the top uh, income, income level. That's clearly uh, that's a very valid uh, uh, question, and we did not really try to pursue that. We were really focusing on this vulnerability dimension, and, it, and I think you'd have to use a very different line of, of, of reasoning, a different set of, of indicators as to try to find that, that line that delineates or separates the middle class from, say, the, the rich, the truly, and, and I haven't really thought much about that. It's possibly that it wouldn't be based so much on a, on a risk of falling into poverty criterion. It'd be some other criterion that we would want to use. And so I've called the middle class basically anyone that's above the vulnerability line, but I acknowledge that that's probably not entirely satisfactory if you want to do a, a real focused analysis of the middle class class and you want to also keep in mind the distinction between the middle class and those that would be considered as, as the rich in, in this society. So that's definitely uh, not something that we're, we've handled adequately in this particular paper. Um, fixed effects, I think, I mean, it's very true that I think in India, as in many of these other data sets that we're looking at, there is this very important fixed effect in the, in the, in the error term, which means that our, our upper bound approach, which assumes no correlation at all uh, uh, is, is clearly not satisfactory. And that also motivates the, the work that we were trying to do where we tried to estimate this correlation coefficient, this parameter rho in the, in the, in the, uh, in the methodology. And I didn't go into great detail here, but what we do precisely is to work with cohort. Uh, and we use the cohort level information to estimate, to produce an estimate of what this row parameter might be. And we then plug that row parameter into the, sort of the parametric version of the, of the method to then generate the, the, the transition probabilities. So it's kind of a, uh, it kind of, it's a, a merging of these different strands. There's a long-standing literature on <coughs> producing pseudo panels based on cohort level analysis. We're trying to work with the unit record level analysis here, but then we do draw on that cohort approach approach to estimate a particular parameter that we need for our for our purposes. So we're trying to integrate, I guess, to some extent these different these different strands of, of, of research. Um, the first question on socioeconomic patterns uh, of vulnerability. Um, I didn't go into uh, that here, but it is perfectly possible to calculate the vulnerable and identify the vulnerable population, say, or the, 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 the chronically poor uh, based on this methodology where you have these, 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 uh, uh, these transition probabilities. You can focus on specific groups of the population, and then you can look in the data at the characteristics of those populations. And so you can look at the characteristics of the chronically poor and try to distinguish those from, say, the characteristics of those who are likely to be transitioning out of poverty or those who are more likely to be transitioning into poverty and to look at, you know, this interesting characteristics that might, that might differ across these different, these different groups. That's something that we've done and we've demonstrated that that's something that you certainly can do. You have to be careful in terms of how far you pursue it because of the cell sizes and the sample, sample sizes. And, you know, there is a whole error that's associated with prediction coming out of the imputation procedure that we're doing here. And then on top of that error comes the sampling error that comes from small cell sizes if you're looking at small numbers of observations. So you have to be careful and cautious in how far you take that kind of disaggregation uh, uh, for that kind of more disaggregated analysis. But we certainly can, you know, you can show things about how the role of secondary education versus the uh, ed primary school only, you know, how that is associated in a different way between those that are chronically poor and those who are more likely to be uh, transitioning out of poverty over time. So there are, there are, there are uh, uh, opportunities to do that kind of work, and I didn't manage to go into that in, in this presentation. Um, I think that's uh, uh, my, my reply so far. Thanks. Very good. So then the second round, I think we had a question over there and then a question here. So let's start with the lady at the back. Okay, my, uh, my name is Prudence Mangejo from the University of the Witwatersrand Strand in South uh, Africa. Please, can you put the mic a little bit closer? Thank uh, you. Okay. Um, my name is Prudence Mangejo from the University of the Witwatersrand Strand in South Africa. And thank you for the very insightful presentation. My questions are directed to the first presenter, Peter. Uh, I'm not so sure about the role of um, time varying characteristics in the predictions from round one to round two when we are in the synthetic panel. Can you please explain uh, a little bit on that? And also I'm wondering the role of uh, unobservable characteristics. Is it going to be captured with the raw parameter that you're talking about? Because I'm thinking maybe we 
may have similar characteristics which are time invariant, but in terms of unobservables, uh, how does your methodology deal with that? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And then we go here in the middle. Uh, Andrea Cornia, University of Florence. My question is addressed to Jim Davis. Uh, is there any attempt to, to <coughs> evaluate the, the Gini assets as well as the, the, G, the asset, the, the total wealth level and the, the wealth composition in relation to changes, large changes in interest rates? I think uh, Tony yesterday mentioned that uh, for instance, with quantitative easing, uh, interest rates are falling, which means that uh, everything has been equal, everybody will borrow, and uh, I mean, this is the intention, and the value of housing goes up, but the rents of bondholders goes down, and uh, so, so I, I think I'm uh, puzzled by the fact that the values which are being presented, they are conditional on the level of interest rate. And one, could one simulate uh, changes in all these uh, variables? Uh, has it been done? Uh, or, I mean, in the U.S., uh, if you take the value of assets uh, before the, uh, or after the housing bubble and or after the housing crisis, I mean, it must be quite different. Uh. Thank you very much. Um we do have time, one, two other questions in front. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Finn Taub. Um, I have, the, the first question I have for Peter, or let, let me begin by first of all saying thank you very much for two brilliant presentations. This is really fascinating. I mean, I, I'd like to convey my appreciation. Uh, first uh, sort of thought uh, around Peter's uh, presentation is just so where does that sort of leave those of us who spent a major part of our life doing panel work? I just sort of, uh, you, just kind of pondering about um, are, are we now becoming, if not superfluous, but we should then lower our level of effort. So, so I'm, I was wondering whether you had a thought or a reflection around that. And, and Jim, you sort of uh, in your presentation, you, you sort of quietly mentioned, with due attention or with due care. Um, I, I was sort of wondering whether you could say or elaborate a little bit on that. I mean, because uh, you, your presentation obviously comes across as incredibly convincing. Um, it's very professional. But I was just sort of wondering, could, could you reflect on some, some of the big decisions or some of the sort of uh, really tricky points? where you would say that mistakes are often made or that that due attention is not being paid. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, any other questions? Please. Right, thanks. Uh, Aspen Lobeck. Um, I'm from, from Norway. Um, could I... Uh, ask, um, I think, Jim, the, what you have of your, your final slide there, um, the wealth-GDP uh, ratio, I mean, the difference between low-income countries, two and four in high-income countries is quite significant. Um, but it's always intriguing to ask, are there any um, countries that doesn't fit the pattern, any outliers, in particular low-income countries which are significantly higher um, than uh, the ratio of two and high-income countries that are significantly lower than, than four. And for, for Peter, I was wondering, um, I mean, the vulnerability um, historically uh, could also be la related to uh, people who have been in the category of poor people who have then moved to the vulner vulnerable group and have a risk of falling back into poverty. Is there any analysis where you would actually also look um, at the history of those in the vulnerable group, whether they have always been um, just above the poverty line or whether they have actually been middle class people going down into the vulnerable group or poor people who have actually moved out of poverty temporarily? Um, thank you very much. I think that now we, we have to go to the answer so that we can go and have some 
coffee in, in, in due time. Uh, would Peter start? Sure, I think I'll, <clears throat> I'll try and go uh, backwards again in order. Um, now on, the, on this question of the kind of work uh, that, that's been done, um, with, based on this approach and, and looking at more closely at the vulnerable and where they've come from and where they've gone and so on. Um, so far, in terms of my own research, I've been very much focused on this sort of methodological aspect of you know, the feasibility and not so much on, on describing these patterns of, of vulnerability and so on. But that is something that's, uh, that's work that's underway, and I might point you to a, a study that's very soon to come out of Latin America, um, out of the Latin America region at the World Bank, which is a study of chronic poverty which uses these methods to sort of identify who the, the chronically poor are, given that in many countries we don't have panel data and we can't actually estimate this directly. They use these synthetic panels to try to identify who the chronically poor are and those who those are that have managed to escape poverty and so on. And then does a very uh, fairly far wide-ranging analysis of circumstances and characteristics and history and, and so on of these groups. So that kind of work that looks more and really tries to tell the story of what, what comes out of these types of data is, I think, obviously the much more interesting part of this whole agenda. It's one that I've not, in, just for reasons of time, not been focusing on so much myself. Uh, uh, so I don't have a whole lot to say at this point. But there is work that's underway, and I think it is a, it's a fairly rich uh, uh, agenda which I, sent, I think in some sense takes me to, to Finn's question about the future of panel data. I mean, I, I would really want to emphasize very, very strongly here that I see this work as n by no means uh, suggesting that we should stop collecting real panel data. I mean, I, I acknowledge that collecting panel data is a, is a difficult thing to do. I, I remember being quite influenced when I was doing my graduate studies by a paper that uh, Orly Ashenfelter, Angus Deaton, and Gary Solon wrote, I think it was an LSMS working paper, where they were just asking this question of whether the LSMS study at the World Bank should be getting into the business of collecting panel data or not. And they were just highlighting how difficult it is and costly and, and complicated it is to do. And I think that's also the reason why we see relatively few countries that are collecting panel data on a very large scale. Having said that, you know, there are efforts, Indonesia, Indian fa Indonesian Family Life Survey, in Mexico there's work underway, there's, there, there are a number of countries where there's panel data being collected. The World Bank itself and the LSMS team has a very active program of collecting panel data in sub-Saharan Africa now. And I think the insights that can come from that kind of data, those type of data are, are enormous, particularly when they're done well. And the kind of insights that we can get from these synthetic panels that I'm describing here is really very limited. I'm describing you know, a few things that we can possibly get some insights out of using these synthetic panels, but it doesn't even scratch the surface of what we can do if we have real, real panel, real panel data. So it's more of a, uh, 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 you know, we're trying to be opportunistic. We have cross-sectional data in many countries. Let's try and get as much out of those cross-sectional data that we can, but it's not, a, it's not really a substitution for collecting panel data in settings where that's a realistic, a very realistic option. At the same time, we should just recognize it is, it is difficult uh, 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 to do uh, good panel data collection. Finally, on the, uh, the, the first question about the time invariant characteristics, let me try to, 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 to very quickly give you the intuition of what the role is of these time invariant characteristics and why they need to be time invariant. You think about, so you're, you have two surveys. You have a survey in, say, time zero and another survey in time period one. And you're interested in the data for time period one. So you have all the households in that data set, and you know what their income level is or their consumption level is in that time period one. But what you would like to know, but you don't because you don't have panel data, you would like to know what their income was at time period zero. So that's your situation. You have the data on their income in time period one, and you would love to know what their what their associated income was in period zero, but you don't know that because you just have cross-section data. Our proposal is to then estimate a model in time period zero that relates consumption in time period zero to household characteristics in time period zero. And that's, we can easily do that with the data from time period zero. Now, if the variables that we use in that model are time invariant, then we can take the parameter estimate on that model estimated in time period zero and plug that in to the data for time period one because the, ver the X variable, the, the, the characteristic, is not changing over time. And that will then give us a reasonable basis for predicting what the consumption level was for a household in time, peri uh, uh, in time period zero for each of those households in our data set in time period one. 
I hope that's that's clear, and I'm very happy to talk perhaps afterwards uh, over coffee to explain it uh, better if I haven't if I haven't done so. But it, it's it's really to try to find that bridge uh, between period one and period zero, and using these explanatory variables, these time these time invariant characteristics to pr to produce that bridge, to provide us with that bridge. <laughs> Thank you very much. And then, Jim, your last comments. Yes, uh, very interesting uh, questions uh, from uh, Andrea Cornia. Um, it, it would be fantastic to be able to do a, a simulation on a global scale, what the impact of changes in interest rates is on the distribution of wealth. Um, as we saw, uh, a country like Japan, where so much of uh, personal financial assets are in you know, form of deposits, uh, there would be much less impact than there would be in the United States where the value of their equities and um, their uh, defined contribution pension plans would be very, you know, really quite sensitive to the interest rate. Um, I, I think that, uh, realistically speaking, the work needs to be done at the national level in uh, some countries that have uh, really good data and also uh, have, um, you know, a body of macroeconomists who are use, used to uh, performing uh, uh, simulations with dynamic general equilibrium models where they have um, um, heterogeneous individuals, so there's actually a distribution of income. So I know that, you know, for example, at my home institution, there are guys that, you know, do work of that type. The U.S. would be the natural place to do this uh, because of the, um, because it has such uh, really excellent uh, uh, wealth data. Uh, I, I think it would be a fascinating thing to do um, because, you know, there are uh, forms of assets that are very sensitive to interest rates. It depends very much on uh, what expectations are about uh, the future, uh, you know, which interest rate is the relevant one, what do you do about the risk adjustment, et cetera. Um, so it would be very interesting to, to, to do, but it hasn't been done. And... So there should be some PhD theses uh, looking at that, I would say. Uh, Fintarp, uh, it's a question of um, what I was uh, signaling about with due care. I think the largest thing is um, to make careful use of uh, survey data. Um, and uh, so that means uh, comparing the survey aggregates with the aggregates from the household balance sheets or other sources where people can get them, uh, making... Uh, adjustments if necessary, uh, thinking about things like um, uh, personal assets that may not be included at all in the in the surveys. So in um, for some reason, which I don't quite understand, in the English-speaking countries, um, there has been a strong move towards including uh, employer-based pensions and, and trying to do, you know, a, a better job of including them. So in Canada, in the last couple of wealth surveys, uh, we have estimates of how much each household's, you know, employer-based pensions are worth, and it's a really big chunk of wealth. Australia does the same thing. The UK has tried to do this in their WAS survey um, with uh, kind of uneven results. So, uh, so that would be another uh, indication of, you know, where do care is required in this respect. If... Um, uh, in a country like the UK, there's a new survey. They're trying to do something important and new. Uh, well, you're going to have to look at that carefully um, and, and more carefully than, say, in a country where there's an established practice and they've taken a long time and, you know, it's, uh, uh, people are quite confident about the quality of that stuff. Uh, so I, I'd say that's the, the major area uh, that I think is uh, is tricky. The pension thing is especially tricky, and this would be a point which is independent of whether you're looking at survey evidence or, or balance sheet evidence. In the national accounts, the uh, value of our pensions is taken to be the value of the assets that are sitting in the fund that is supporting the pension, right? So if you have a defined benefit pension plan and you're working for uh, the government or for some employer which is very unlikely to go bust, and the market's uh, go down, as they did in, you know, 07, 08, uh, how much has your pension wealth changed? Maybe it hasn't changed at all because, you know, uh, you, you're not bearing the risk. The government or your employer is, is bearing the risk, right? Completely opposite for defined contribution people. 
Um, so, yeah. So those are some tricky things. And uh, then finally, um, oh yes, uh, are there any outliers in wealth income ratios? I, I, I wish I had a, a sheet in front of me. Uh, it's uh, very dynamic. You know, we were seeing that uh, just in the last few years, the wealth income ratios in France, UK, the United States have been changing quite a bit. You know, in some countries, they've, they've been trending up. In other countries, they've recently, you know, done these fluctuations. So it would uh, even matter whether we were looking at year 2000 or year, year 2010, 2013. Um, and then... Um, so you think about develop, uh, developing countries. Um, well, if you have a, a nascent uh, miracle economy that's starting from a, a low wealth income ratio and they have a very high saving rate, uh, you might think, well, the thing in the numerator is going to go up really fast. Well, the denominator is going up fast as well. So, you know, uh, it's a bit ambiguous uh, what's going to happen there. And um, uh, you can... I'm thinking more in terms of models than I am in terms of facts, I have to admit. But uh, in um, a slow-growing, traditional, underdeveloped country, you can have a high wealth-income ratio. And Raymond Goldsmith actually called attention to this. And he said, you know, the wealth and the capital are not being used efficiently uh, in uh, these you know, cases of stagnation. And there were more of those cases back when he was writing than there are today. So you can have a high wealth income ratio, say in a Southeast Asian country that's not growing very fast. Um, uh, and it may be that when growth improves, the wealth income ratio actually comes down. And uh, the, the other thing is, uh, again, if we go back to developed countries, uh, it depends how much of your economic activity is being run through the public sector uh, versus the private sector. So, you know, so country like the U.S. like to try and do everything through the private sector in Scandinavia, Canada, Europe generally, you know, um, uh, hospitals and uh, colleges and universities and so on. These, all these things are in the public sector, but it is possible to, uh, to uh, locate those in the private sector. And so if you look at the transition economies, um, they... Uh, Many of them had a, a rejection of doing things through the public sector, and so uh, over time they may, you know, end up as outliers on, on the um, wealth income uh, ratio. Although that's not the case at the moment. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Jim. Uh, this ends our session. We are running ten minutes late, but as we started a bit late, so I took the the privilege of extending the session a, a little bit. Uh, thank you once again for Peter and, and Jim for presentations that definitely provided food for thought. We don't live on good ideas only, so let's go and have some coffee and uh, next session will start at 11. Thank you. <laughs>